What's up guys, in this video, what I wanna do is help you identify the domain of a square root function. Now, I'm gonna do that by working through five different examples to help you understand the concept. I hope you enjoy, cheers. Ladies and gentlemen, when we, be when we began this course, we talked about two constraints that we have on our variable x. And besides that, we've been pretty consistent with that. We've only talked about a little couple other constraints. What we talked about was when you have one when you have x in the denominator, x cannot equal 0. And when you had x under a radical, x had to be greater than or equal to 0. Do you guys remember those? We went over them a lot. A lot of you guys had a really big trouble with that, um, remembering that information. These are the only two constraints that we discussed at the beginning of the year. Only two. It's only two constraints. We talked about a little bit more once we talked about cos inverse functions. And once we get into logarithms, I can go over more restraints. But these are the only two restraints that we have that we've talked about with functions. So does my square root of x minus 16 fall into one of those restrictions? Yes. We know that that needs to be greater than or equal to 0. So all I do is take my, radic my radicand, and I set it greater than or equal to 16. So then I solve for 16 or solve for x to find the values of 16 or of x that will satisfy um, this expression. And what we see is x has to be greater than or equal to 16. Okay? Just remember if a uh, random example, what if the problem was this? What if my expression was that? What do we know? What is the only values of x that x cannot be that would not satisfy this equation? Well, when x is equal to 0, right? Or we can't have the denominator equal to 0. So what you would do is just say x minus 16 equals 0. So you set your denominator equal to 0, and then you solve. So we'd say x cannot equal 16, right? So you guys are going to be doing two different types of problems there. It's either going to be um, a rational expression or a, thing, um, or a radical expression. We have f of x equals square root of 2x minus 3. Is there any restriction implied or any restriction given to us? Yeah, but is there any restriction given to us? No. So the implied domain is all real numbers, right? However, we realize that there's an x under a radical, right? And we know that whenever there's an x under a radical, it's not so much actually, I kind of can see how this, what I wrote down could be confusing. Because it's not so much x has to be greater than or equal to 0 but it's the quantity under the radical has to be greater than or equal to 0. This quantity that you're taking the square root of has to be greater than or equal to 0. So my, I do have a restriction on its domain. It's not given to us, but it's a restriction that we've talked about. So therefore, my restriction, I have 2x minus 3, has to be greater than or equal to 0. So now, to find my domain, I just solve for x. Okay, now x has to be greater than or equal to 3 halves. So what values can x not be equal to? Anything less than 3 halves, right? Correct? So if you look, if you kind of think about this, if you have negative infinity to infinity, right, that's your implied domain. But we can't have any negative numbers, right? Can't have any negative numbers. So that whole side doesn't even work um, over there, at least, because x has to be greater than or equal to. Um, 3 halves. So 3 halves is right around here, or is right there. It, my graph has to be equal to 3 halves. It has to be equal to 3 halves or to the right. So anything to the left of 3 halves is not within the domain. It's only saying it has to be 3 halves or equal to. The difference in the last one was we were just finding the values you know, that, weren't in, that made the denominator equal to 0 that weren't part of our domain. So the way to write our domain is instead of going from negative infinity to infinity, we're going to go from 3 halves to infinity. However, a difference. Do you guys remember when I was doing the asymptotes? I said, hey, it's either a whole or it's an asymptote, right? right? The graph doesn't exist at that value. When we did rational, the graph does not exist at that value. If it doesn't exist, 
If there's actually a number that doesn't exist, we use the parentheses. Infinity is not a finite number, so we use the parentheses. However, does 3 halves exist? Yes, and the function is valued at 3 halves, so we use a bracket. Okay? When it's not a value of the function or it's not a finite number like infin or such as f infinity or negative infinity, we're going to use brackets. But if it's a uh, number that is evaluated uh, for a function, we're going to use a bracket. Okay? But you see, I have a square root. I cannot take the square root of a negative number. Everybody agrees with that, right? So, or I'm sorry. So therefore, all the numbers on the side of this radical has to be greater than or equal to 0. Has to. Can't take the square root of a negative number. So everything under here has to be greater than or equal to 0. So you can just solve for t. Add t. So therefore, 5 is greater than or equal to t. Or you could say t is less than or equal to 5. You could also subtract 5, divide by negative 1, and flip the sign. You get the exact same answer. So all values of t have to be less than or equal to 5. So how far, how far less than can we go? Negative infinity. And then the highest value we can get to has to be 5. And then can we use, that can't be included. Can 5 be in the answer? Yes, because if you put 5 in for t, that's 0. That's fine. Yes, you'll need to know the difference. Yeah. yeah. Now, the only thing I do want to tell you is, well, some people are like, well, when do we, why would it change? What about if this was in the denominator? What if I just change the answer to this? Let's just change the function real quick. If I changed it to 1 over the square root of 5 minus t, you can still put in a 5 into the You can still take the square root of 0, but can now 0 be in the denominator? No, so now that domain would look like this. Okay. Again, if we look at our implied domain, we're going to imply our domain is going to be all real numbers, right? However, we have some restrictions, though, because we know this is restricted. Because the only, there's two restrictions we're going to talk about in this class. When x is in the denominator and when x is under a square root. Do we have x under a square root? So we have to look at that restriction. What exactly is that restriction? x, the value, the basic restriction is whatever's under the radical has to be greater than or equal to 0. It can equal 0, and it has to be greater than, right? Because we can't take the square root of negative numbers if we're dealing with the real number system, right? Square root of negative numbers is the imaginary number system. So what you're going to do is this whole thing has to be greater than or equal to 0. So you just set your radicand. Remember last time we set the denominator? Now you're going to set the radicand, which is going to be greater than or equal to 0. Because we know whatever the values of x have to make that equal to 0. Now we go ahead and solve. I'm going to use inverse operations on this one because I want to remind you of something. What happens when we divide by a negative number with inequalities? Flip the sign, right? So x has to be less than or equal to 8. Before we write the domain, let's think about this graphically. x has to be less than 8, right? So that, is there any restriction on how small x can be? No. So it's going to be going somewhere all the way over here, right? But then it's going to go all the way to 8. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. But it's going to stop. It can't go past 8, right? It can't be greater than 8. So the domain is really from negative infinity to how far to the right? To 8. Now, can it equal 8, though? Yes. yes. Since it can equal 8, we use a bracket. It can't equal negative infinity, so that's still a parenthesis. Remember in that last example, it couldn't equal negative 3 sevenths. Because if it equaled negative 3 sevenths, that made the denominator equal to 0. It can equal 8. You can have a square root 0. We just can't have it negative. Okay, So that's your domain for that one. In this example, guys, we see we have a radical well, we have the square root, right? And based on what we have talked about and learned today, we know that you cannot take the square root of any number that's less than 0, right? It has to be positive, OK? So all I'm going to ask you guys to do when you guys see a radical, for right now, for today, is just set the radicand greater than or equal to 0. It doesn't matter if there's a number outside, well, at least for right now, 
It doesn't matter if there's like a number outside of the radical, not the fourth root. But like if you multiply this by something else, like for instance, if I multiply this by x squared, is x squared a continuous function? Yeah, so it's not affecting my domain, right? It doesn't matter if I'm multiplying this by any number outside. Only thing we're concerned about is what is under the radical, at least for right now. What is, that's all we're concerned about. We know that whatever is under our radical, 1 fourth x minus 2 has to be greater than or equal to 0. Done. That's the only thing I need you guys to focus on right now. So now, when we look at this, we say, all right, well then what values make this true? So it's just going back to our Algebra 1 days and solving. Okay, If we're multiplying by 1 fourth, then we could multiply by the reciprocal on both sides. x has to be greater than or equal to 8. Now, could you graph this on a number line, right? like what we did over here? And then could you find the domain? Yes. Or could we just write the domain from here? Yes. Does 8 and then all numbers that are greater than 8 is going to go to infinity? Remember, since it's equal to, 8 is included. Okay.